I must admit I've been looking forward to Easter at Clearwater. I thank all the uh, musicians, all the participants, indeed the entire congregation for making this already very special. I think you can feel it, can't you? What a wonderful day this is. Um, I usually like to start my sermon with a bit of a, a story or a joke, and my wife assured me that with this one I might need some sympathy laughter. So please help me out at the end of this one, if you will. But it involves a man, thanks guys, it involves a man uh, who uh, was an artist and he got some paintings he wanted to sell. So he goes to a local gallery and he says, I've got these paintings, I, I, can you help me to sell them? So the guy says, yeah. He said, what I'll do is I'll put them on display for a couple of weeks, maybe the normal commission. And so they're on display and after about a week, the artist goes back to the gallery to see how things are going. And the gallery owner went, well, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Okay, what's the good news? He said, well, I had a guy come in yesterday. He looked over the paintings, and he asked the question, will these paintings appreciate in value after the artist dies? <laughs> so I said, yes, and he bought all of them. Well, that's fantastic, said the artist. What possibly could be the bad news? Well, the guy was your doctor. <laughs> more sympathy, more sympathy, please. <laughs> In a weird kind of way, that sort of illustrates Jesus for us. That somehow he was of greater value after he died. Think about that. To us, he is somehow greater value after he died. I mean, here was Jesus. He'd spent three years ministering primarily in the region of Galilee. He was followed by this ragtag bunch of 12 men from various backgrounds. He had ministered to thousands upon thousands of people. And in fact, one week prior to today, last Sunday if you recall, we recognized them celebrating him as a, a king, as the prophet that Moses had foretold, as indeed the Messiah. They were celebrating that fact just a week before Easter Sunday. And yet five days later, on what we call Good Friday, they'd all turned their backs on him as he was nailed to that cross. And by the end of that Friday, Jesus was absolutely and completely dead. Make no mistake about that. He was absolutely and completely dead. So on Easter Sunday, on that third day, as people went to visit the tomb, they were looking for a dead man. That's exactly what they were looking for. The two Marys weren't living, looking for a living man. They were going to anoint the body of Jesus. Peter and John, when they ran to that tomb and looked inside, they did not expect it to be empty. John says that. He said they did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Everyone thought that Jesus was still dead. An area of study that I personally have quite appreciated in recent years is the area of theology. I enjoy sort of digging into the, to, to, to Scripture, understanding God. I've taken some classes on theology. It's just been an, an area of great interest for me. And theology is a process of contemplation, a principle through which we try and look at God and understand how God thinks. Now, that's easier said than done because we can only do it within the window of what God reveals about himself. And so God is way bigger than anything we could possibly understand, but he's revealed enough. And so the process of theology is to try and understand God through that process, through that window. Where theology begins to fail is when people go beyond those parameters, when they go into the area of the unknown and the subjective. That's where theology begins to fail. And so it was for painter and mystic William Blake. Blake refused to view the crucifixion of Jesus as simply a bodily death. Rather, he saw it as an event of the self-emptying of God. As Thomas Elitzer writes, Blake celebrates a cosmic and historical movement of the Godhead that culminates in the death of God himself thereby creating what is called the God is dead theology. And this has gained some traction, I suppose, in more recent years. 
As people who adhere to this God is dead theology, based on the understanding that God actually isn't necessary anymore. Therefore, by not being necessary, God is dead. That's what this theology says. The idea is basically the same. Yeah, God is useful. He's just not necessary. Today, what I want us to do is to really consider our personal notion of God. And I want us to ask ourselves very honestly, is God truly alive in my life today? But before we go any further, please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, this morning as we gather on this exciting morning, and how exciting it's been, we've raised our voices to you in worship. We've heard beautiful music. And yet, Heavenly Father, we come to this point of exploring your word and exploring our understanding of you and your word. I pray this morning that we're very honest with ourselves. And that indeed through that process you will convict us as we need to be convicted in our understanding of how truly we live our lives in light of a risen Savior. And Lord God, this morning, if there's any of us that realize that perhaps we're not doing that, that we see you as useful but not necessary, that you will redirect our thoughts and our paths and indeed our lives to a true understanding of the absolute necessity of a risen Savior. Oh, I pray this in and through Jesus' name. Amen. To be honest, I think one of the biggest weaknesses today in the church and behind the pulpit is the preaching of the notion that God is useful. He can kind of help you with stuff. And I think many, many preachers, and I include myself perhaps in this, can be guilty about talking about Jesus as though he's there to make our lives just a little bit easier. He can help me with my Financial needs, I've got financial woes. Oh, Lord, help me with my financial needs. Sort them out for me. He could help with our physical needs. How often we go before the Lord on behalf of ourselves or others praying for physical help. Sometimes we pray, Lord, help me to find my car keys. I can't find them in a hurry. God is useful, is what we're preaching there. Now, don't get me wrong. God can help you with any of these things. But when we reduce him to simply these things, then we have a problem. And I think a story in the Bible that helps us to understand this concept or this notion is the story that we find in Mark chapter 10. As Jesus encounters a young man or a young ruler, as other books call him. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Notice in that list, that's not all the commandments. Four are missing. The four commandments that that pertain to our devotion of God were not listed there. Teacher, the man declared. All of these things I have kept since I was a boy. And then Mark writes this, an easily lost verse, but remarkable. In verse 21, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. What a a line. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus already knew that this man was about to reject him, and yet Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Very often we hear that story uh, preached from the standpoint of money being a barrier to our following Jesus. But I see this very differently. I see this as an immense love story. Because Jesus was loving this man that he knew was about to reject him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And in many ways, what that man had done was to put Jesus up on the cross. That's what he'd done. You're useful, but you're not necessary. And so many of us who claim to be Christians can be like that. I've heard many a person say, yes, I'm a Christian, But I don't go to church. I don't think I need to go to church. I remember the first time I met someone like this, it was actually up in Maryland. 
I was living there when I first moved to the States, and there was a man who I would never have guessed, quite frankly, was a follower of Christ. And one Sunday morning, I'm in my uniform, ready to go to the Salvation Army, and he asked me where I'm going, and I said, I'm going off to church. He said, oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I said, where do you go to church? Oh, I don't go to church. I don't need to go to church. I'll tell you, the guy did need to go to church. <laughs> no two ways about it. You see, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the concept of church. There are a lot of people out there who think you can be part of Christ without being part of a church congregation. But the church, is it not, is described as the body of Christ. It's an institution that Jesus Christ himself brought about. He told Peter, you're the rock on which I will build my church. And then we see in the book of Acts, that first congregation, that group of 120 people who gathered together. These 120 people would have been a lot safer if they'd just done their own thing in their homes. They would have been a lot safer. But they knew that that corporate worship was what was expected, what was needed. They knew that's what Jesus required by way of the church. And pretty soon, it was with that 120 that the Holy Spirit came. The day of Pentecost arrived and 5,000 were added to their number, it says, on that day. And so then these 5,000 went back to their homes and they started congregations and groups and bringing people together. And God was thrilled with what he saw. And then all through the New Testament, we see the growth of the church where we are given doctrine and instruction. We are told in the New Testament that the church is the body of Christ. Uh, no better time than in 1 Corinthians when Paul writes, just as the body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made of many parts, uh, one part, but of many. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of all kinds of tongues. So quite frankly... If you are simply doing your own thing and not participating in a church congregation, what you have done is you have believed and then you have walked away. You have said God is useful, but he's not necessary. And in that sense, you've put him back on the cross. And when you walked away, Jesus looked at you and he loved you. Jesus looked at you and he loved you. And the problem, I think, of putting back Jesus back on the cross, if you will, killing Jesus, is not simply limited to those who are occasional visitors to the church. It also can apply to us who claim truly to follow him. But we follow him when it's convenient. I think this is another problem we have, is that we've made church very convenient, perhaps overly accommodating. Because there was no convenience in the early church, was there? It was a thing of great inconvenience. If you worshipped in a church, you were facing death. And in the early church, and we read this in the book of Acts, the guy that was in charge of the death group, if you will, was Saul, who would become the apostle Paul. We see the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr, and there it says, Saul was looking on approvingly. The next thing we know about Saul is he's going to the high priest saying, give me letters of introduction that I might take them to Damascus, get into the synagogues, round up these Christians, these followers of the way, and I will bring them back to Jerusalem for you to deal with. And so it was this persecutor of the church was on that road to Damascus, and not far from Damascus, when suddenly a bright light came out, so bright that it blinded him and sent him to his knees. Followed by a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? That's a great story, isn't it? And Saul was taken into Damascus. In the meantime, there was a man called Ananias. Ananias, a good follower of Christ, a follower of the way. Probably minding his own business when suddenly the Lord spoke to him. says, Ananias, I've got a job for you. I've got this fellow down there on Straight Street. He did go down there. His name's Saul. Got a message. Oh, says Ananias, uh, not me. Have you heard about this guy, Lord? Do you know who this is? He's the guy that persecutes the church. He's going to kill me. The Lord says, Ananias, I need you to go. I've got a message for him. And eventually, and fair enough to say reluctantly, 
Ananias went. And this is the message that God gave to him. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. How much do you suffer for his name? Maybe we don't suffer enough. That's a harsh thing to hear and maybe even to say, but are we not called to take up our cross and to follow him? And by following him, we looked at Jesus and his suffering. Jesus suffered when he came here to earth. He suffered by living a nomad's life. He suffered because he was continually rejected. He suffered when he was tried. He suffered when he was beaten. He was suffered when he was nailed to a cross. He suffered when he was mocked by a crowd. He suffered when he was hanging there in excruciating pain. He suffered when he was given vinegar to drink, when he was thirsty, and he suffered and died. And that's what we've been called to do, is to suffer alongside him. You see, when the first Christians met, they were in grave danger. When they were discovered, they were rounded up. And all kinds of things were done to them until eventually they were fed to the lions. That was the sport that went on with the Christians at that time. And yet during that time, the church grew and grew and grew. And the realization is that suffering is the most compelling evidence of a risen Christ. And so it was Paul and all the Christians who have since followed him. We have been called to suffer. But the suffering isn't for Jesus. We are called to suffer with Jesus. Not for him, but for his name. Because the most persuasive evidence of that risen Christ is just that. But we don't suffer, do we? In fact, what we often can do is stand there and point fingers at the world and tell it how evil it is. And we think we're an example of how life should be lived, of Christian morality, and hoping that somehow we can guilt people into believing in Jesus Christ. So what we've done instead of making people or persuading people to Christ is we've made people suspicious of him. After all, what is our level of suffering? Well, maybe it's an uncomfortable pew. Maybe the temperature isn't quite right. Maybe it's when the sermon goes on just a little bit too long. Or maybe it's on a Sunday morning getting out of bed when I'd rather stay in it. Friends, you and me, trust me on this one. I think we've lost the plot just a little bit. And in many ways, we too can be guilty of putting Jesus back on that cross. Suffering comes in many ways. In the States right now, I don't know that there are a lot of ways that we really will suffer. Doesn't mean suffering doesn't come though, does it? Suffering comes in many forms. I've seen some people suffer through illnesses in such a way that I am convinced that Christ lives in their hearts. And through history, there have been many instances where people have suffered many dark days in the history of mankind. And one such dark time was the period of apartheid in South Africa. There is a story, and you may have heard this story before. It's a remarkable story. It's rather like watching a good movie. It's one of those stories, even if you've heard it before, boy, it's great to revisit it because it's remarkable. And it involves a 70-year-old woman. She's standing in a courtroom, a very emotionally charged courtroom. And she's listening to white policemen as they acknowledge the atrocities that they did to this woman and to her family. Mr. Van der Broek acknowledges that one night he went to the house of this woman and he just took away her 18-year-old son. They took him to a field. They shot him at point-blank range and then burned his body as he and his officers parted nearby. He then admitted that eight years later, he went back to this home 
And this time he took the woman's husband. The woman didn't know where he'd gone. There was nothing she could do. These were the police doing this. And then he admitted that several days later he had returned yet again to this house. And this time he took the woman. He put her in a car and he drove her to a field. And he put the headlights of the car onto a wood pile on top of which was her husband bound. And they made her watch as they poured gasoline over him and lit a match and threw it on him. And as they're striking that match, the last words of her husband, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then she watched as her husband burned to death. And now here she is in a courtroom, sitting opposite the man who had completely destroyed her life. A member of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Committee turned to the woman at the end of the trial and said, you who have suffered so much, much at the hands of these men, what should be done to them? What should their punishment be? And the 70-year-old woman stood up and said very firmly, I want three things. The first thing I want is to be taken to the place where my husband was burned so I can gather up his ashes and give them a decent burial. The second thing I want, Mr. Van der Broek took my family away from me. I have no family now because of that. So I want Mr. Van der Broek to become my son. I want him to visit me twice a month in the ghetto so I can pour out as much love as I have left upon him. And the third thing I want is that someone will escort me across the courtroom so I can take Mr. Van der Broek in my arms and tell him he is truly forgiven. Because those were the last words of my husband, and Jesus died to forgive me of my sins. As she walked across the courtroom, out of sheer shock, Mr. Van der Broek faints. And then suddenly, the friends and the family, people who had endured decades of oppression, began to sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's suffering. But it's the suffering of a person that knew Jesus as, as being alive, as being risen, as being relevant, as being necessary. Friends, this morning, as we encounter a world out there, the greatest weapon we can go out there with is forgiveness. Because forgiveness is the greatest gift we have received. So this morning, as the melody plays of that song that you know so well, it's a time of response to come forward, to kneel at this place. As we've been doing recently, please feel free to kneel at the mercy seat and nobody will come and counsel you. It's time for you to be with Jesus Christ, to thank him for the grace that you have received and to pray that you in turn can show that grace to a world that needs it so badly. If you'd like someone to come alongside you to pray with you, stand at this holiness table here. But now is an unhurried time. It is a special time. So come forward as the music plays.
Heavenly Father, this morning, as we just have this time, this unhurried time, and as we think about the sacrifice that you, well, you gave of yourself, in my place, oh, Lord, we talk about that so tritely at time, and I'm sorry that we do that. But if you think about the suffering that you were prepared to go through for us, may we remember, Heavenly Father, that we in turn are called to suffer for you. And Lord, in this world where sin seems to reign, and where the consequences of sin are all around us, including our own bodies getting older and less able, help us to recognize, Lord, that through this suffering, through all of this, we need to show evidence of you. Evidence of our trust and our faith in you. Evidence that we believe that you are necessary to us. Heavenly Father, may we all recognize that need in our hearts. For those kneeling before you this morning, Lord God, I pray as they, as they come forward and, uh, and, and spend this time with you, that they, the needs that they have, that the needs that are presenting to you, that Lord, you will meet those needs. That, Heavenly Father, they will trust you with those needs. And that we're reminded of the necessity of a living Lord. Let's sing together that, that second verse of this song. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. read here through many dangers toils and snares I have already come Twas grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home isn't that a reminder of the significance of grace upon our lives that grace shown by the sacrifice of Christ by his resurrection on the third day by his ascension into heaven where he sits right now at the right hand of the father interceding on our behalf Grace changed everything. And friends, it's a world that needs grace. Let's stop fighting hate with hate. Let's simply respond with love. Because that's the message of forgiveness. Let's sing together and stand indeed together as we sing together the fourth verse of this wonderful song. <laughs> 